So, today, what we're going to do is run through how to make a basic no-need sourdough loaf at home. Um, you only need three ingredients to make great bread. Uh, you just need some flour, some water, and some salt. If there's anything else, the fourth thing is time. It is a bit of a slow process. Uh, I like to do it over two days, but you can compress that if you need to. Um, but very, very doable at home. So, as I mentioned, we're gonna go through how to make lovely bread like this. So this is our basic no-need sourdough loaf. That's a, a bull, and uh, that's a good sort of one and a half pound loaf. Now, to make this bread, we're gonna run through 10 steps. And this is what we're gonna be working through today, step by step, talking about each one, and um, giving you all the tips and tricks you need to set you up for success to make this bread at home. So first thing is gonna be the starter, and then the leaven prep. Uh, we're then gonna talk about mixing your dough, uh, the auto lease process, then moving on to our replacement for kneading, which is the stretch and, st uh, stretch and fold process. Exactly what it sounds like. Um, then we'll move on to the bulk proof, talk a bit about shaping, then uh, about cold proofing overnight, which is what we do for this. And then we're gonna score and bake. So, let's get straight into it. Guys, too, if you have any questions um, at the end, we're going to do this for about 45 minutes, and then at the end, take some notes, and Ange will be able to ask, uh, answer your questions. Thanks, Joe. I'll do my best anyway. Okay, so, what is a sourdough starter? Well, it's what we all used to use before we had dry commercial yeast. And at its most basic, it's just a mix of flour and water. So, I use a nice organic rye flour, stone ground, Good to look out for those things um, if you're able to pick and choose um, and what we do is we mix that with equal quantities of water tap water is fine if you've got filtered even better but um, if you are using tap water just leave it out at room temperature for about half an hour if your tap water is chlorinated that just gives it a chance to air out before you use it you know it's like you know, jumping into a chlorinated swimming pool stings your eyes same thing for the sourdough starter so, by combining those two ingredients, we're creating a lovely little home for the natural yeast and friendly bacteria that are in our environment all around us. Um, we're just capturing them and concentrating them. So, to make your own little sourdough starter, uh, it's a fairly easy process. It just takes about a week. So, what you want to do is you grab a teaspoonful of flour, teaspoonful of water, put that in a nice little jar, mix that up, wait a day and then repeat the process. And then you keep doing that for a few days until you start seeing signs of life. You'll start to see some lovely little bubbles like that. Um, it'll raise up in size and those are all good indications that you're on the right track. I find that these little small jars work really well because we are trying to um, minimize the amount of resources that we're using. Uh, if you look online, you might see a lot of information that says, you know, start with 100 grams of flour, 100 grams of water, stir it up, next day throw it away. I'm of the waste not want not generation, and you don't need to do that. You can start out with a very small amount of flour and just build it up. Just keep what you need. So a little snug 100 millimeter jar like that works perfectly. Uh, these are available on the website. Okay, now as I mentioned, that's quite a lengthy process and um, it'll be a couple of weeks before your starter really gets established and really starts going for it. So if you can, get on your local community pages, talk to your friends, nip out to a good sourdough bakery and beg, borrow or barter for a little bit of sourdough starter. You only need about a teaspoonful to get going and if you look after it, it's gonna last you forever and it's never gonna run out. And I mean that. I mean, recently uh, I read something about how they found a little bit of dried sourdough starter in a clay pot in an Egyptian tomb. The scientists who found it mixed that up again, revived it and baked some bread with it. You might think you've killed it. You haven't. Give it another shot. It's gonna be fine. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about this starter check if there's anything I've missed. Oh, if you want a little bit more information about how to make your own, then hop onto my Instagram feed. 
um, I've got some instructions on there, and uh, Joe's going to email some stuff out afterwards to help you get on the right track with it. So, another thing to note is that friendly bacteria in there is actually responsible for making the lactic acid, which gives sourdough starter, sourdough bread, this lovely tang. So that's the same sort of stuff that you'll find in yogurt. Um, kombucha, kimchi, sauerkraut, it's all good stuff, you know, really gut friendly stuff, really good for you. So have a little sniff, it should smell a bit like apple cider vinegar, maybe a bit of a yoga tea tang. Um, and those are basically the, the good signs that you're looking for to know that your sourdough start is active. Now, you can keep it at room temperature on your bench top in your kitchen if you're baking regularly. But if you do that, you are going to need to refresh it daily. That means feeding it the same amount of water, same amount of flour. And that's going to you know, end up giving you a rather large sourdough starter, which isn't what we want. So I tend to keep mine in the fridge. My routine goes from about a Thursday night. I'm a weekend baker. I get my sourdough starter out the fridge. I give it a, a feed of fresh flour and water and uh, wait for that to bubble up. It normally takes about four to 12 hours. Then I give it another feed because we're amping it up, getting it ready to use. If you start using a young or a sourdough starter that isn't properly established yet, or if you use a starter that's a bit too old and has that really sour sort of nail varnish remover tang, you're not gonna get the best results with your brain. So you wanna make sure that your starter is really fully active. That's the best tip I can give you. Uh, if, if it's not quite ready to go, you're gonna get a slightly flatter, a lot more sour loaf. And that's not quite what we're going for today. We're going for a nice, uh, basic sourdough loaf with an even crumb that's gonna be a perfect all-rounder for sandwiches, toast, that kind of stuff. All right, so when you have fully revived your starter, normally takes about two feeds for me before the starter is good to go, then what we're gonna do is take off a tiny bit and literally like 20 mils is plenty, uh, that's about 20 grams, put that in a separate jar. And then what we're gonna do, put this one safely back in the fridge because we've got to take care of this and we don't want to run out. And we start building up a leaven. Now, leaven, levain, levain, depending on where you're from, it's just a French word for starter. But actually, um, in grout purposes, it's just gonna be a young, fresh, very, very active starter that we're gonna use in our recipe. So the cool thing about building up a separate one means that A, we're not gonna accidentally use all our starter and then run out, and B, we can use the flour that we're gonna bake with in our recipe. So it gives our little yeasty beasties a chance to uh, just adjust to the new flour. So mine's kept at 100% rye. In the recipe we're gonna be running through today, uh, we've got a combination of whole uh, whole wheat flour, and that's a nice organic stone ground one. And we're also gonna be using a strong baker's flour, organic as well. That's a white flour. Um, the key thing to look out for there is that it's a, at least nine grams of protein. Okay, so protein is what gives us the glutes and development, the real stretch, which is gonna give our dough the strength to build a nice crumb structure. And by crumb structure, I just mean like the internal texture of the bread. You don't want something that's too holy, just nice and even. Okay, so once we've got our little bit of starter to kickstart things, no pun intended, yeah, it totally was, uh, then we're just gonna take equal quantities of flour and water. So we're gonna go in with 20 grams of flour and 20 grams of water. As I mentioned, the water's just been sitting out at room temperature, nothing fancy going on there. And then we're just gonna use a combination of the two flours we're gonna bake with. So we're gonna use the whole wheat and the white flour, 10 grams of each. We mix that together, we put it on to one side, and in a few hours we should see some bubbling. But that's not quite there yet, okay? We're gonna be asking our, our leaven to do a lot of heavy lifting when we make our dough. So we're gonna carb load it, right? We're gonna carb load it like we're about to do city to surf. So we're gonna feed it again. Once we've got those bubbles going and it's nice and active, we're gonna go in with another 30 grams of water, another 30 grams of flour, 50-50 mix again. And then what you're looking for, that's why I got the lackey band on it, is once that's doubled in size, 
and we've got that lovely development of bubbles in there. It's looking like nice and spongy and foamy. Take the lid off, you can see some bubbles in the top. That's when we know it's really good to go. And use your senses as well. It should have a nice mild yogurty smell. Um, we can smell all the beery kind of goodness of the yeast working there now. And that's gonna to translate to a really tasty loaf. So those are the good things that you've got to look out for. So that covers our starter development, building our leaven, and now we're gonna ramp up onto our recipe and mixing. So just give me a second to have a sip of water here. A lot of talking. I am adequately caffeinated, but it's always a bit hard to, uh, to, to talk non-stop. All right, so guys, other key things to use. Get yourself a nice glass bowl. These Pyrex ones are perfect, you want a large one for this. The reason why we use glass is because it's more thermally stable, so it's gonna keep a nice stable environment for our little yeasty beasties to work in. It's a living thing, don't let that freak you out. Normal uh, baker's yeast is a living thing as well. So if you're comfortable, it's gonna be comfortable. Room temperature, perfect. The other thing to get is a decent digital scale. Um, that's just gonna take out more, take out the variables so that you're more likely to get stuff right. Uh, eventually you'll be able to eyeball it, do it all by feel, but initially just, um, just measure everything, try and get as accurate as you can. A couple of grams either way is absolutely fine. Okay, so get our bowl ready. Now, I'm gonna talk you through a nice easy low hydration recipe. Right, now, what you'll see with a lot of recipes is that they're all expressed in percentages. That's called the baker's percentage. And that percentage is everything expressed to the total of flour in the recipe. So think of it this way, if we've got a kilo of flour and we're doing a 60% hydration recipe, that means we're gonna need 60% flat water to the flour component. So a kilo of flour, 60% water gives us 600 grams. Our recipe today is going to be about 60% as well, and that's a nice starting point. As you get more confident, you can up the hydration, start having a bit of fun with it, get that more, more artisan loaf. But initially, stick to the quantities in the recipe, do it a couple of times, and then start having some fun with it. Once you're getting nice consistent results, then you'll be on the right track. So I always say, try and do the recipe at least three times. Okay. Um, also, stick to one times the recipe for the first few goes. And I've provided quantities to double up the recipe as well. Down the line, you might want to start doing double batches. You know, if you're going through the effort of making a loaf, you might as well make two. And then, you know, you've got one spare or one to gift out. What normally happens is our, in our house is that one doesn't make it past the table, doesn't get to even cool down. So we need one just for the next day. Okay, so on, back onto the recipe, enough waffle. We're gonna go in first with our water. Room temperature, normal tap water, filtered if you've got it, that's great. All right, so we've got about 250 grams here, which is gonna be our 250 mils of water or 60%. So get that in your bowl. There we go, spot on. And the next thing we're gonna go in with is our leaven. Now this also gives us an opportunity to uh, check how it's going. So if our leaven is really at its peak and most optimal point to use in our recipe, we can do the float test. So just get a little blob out. And if that bobs around and floats in your bowl of water like that's doing, that means that there's plenty of air bubbles in there. It's heaps active and it's good to go. So we're going in with 100 grams, which is pretty much all of our leaven. And that's at about 20%, remember, to that proportion of flour. Okay, so get that into your bowl. Give that a little mix, just to combine it, make sure everything's evenly distributed. And that's gonna make sure that kind of everything's moved around enough, uh, nice and even, so we can get a nice even fermentation in the next step. So just mix it up, It'll go a bit milky, lots of bubbles, aerated, that's what we're going for. Next thing we're gonna do is go in with our flour. Now, as I mentioned, it's all expressed in the total to the flour, but our flour component is made up 
with whole wheat flour, whole grain flour, basically brown flour, the stuff brown bread used to be made from. And we're just going to go in with 50 grams of that, which is going to be about 12% of our total amount of flour. So get that in there. I like to get that in first, just because, you know, we've got some little husky bits in there or wheat germ. And it takes a teeny bit longer for that to fully soak up all the water. So I'll get that in, give it a little stir around. 50 grams in. Done. Okay, next step. Let's go in with our lovely stone ground organic white baker's flour. Get that in there. And that's 350 grams gone in, which is the remaining 90% of our flour in the recipe. Let's put those to one side. Okay, so for those following along at home, we're now down at the mixing stage. I might just swap out to a bigger spatula at this stage. Nothing fancy going on now. All we're gonna do is mix the flour and water together. I like to get a nice big spatula for this. Ooh. Apron essential. Try not to waste like that. I mean, you can get away with using very minimal flour in this process. All right, so carefully now, rather than dusting everything, we'll just go around that bowl and fold in the flour and the water. All we're doing at this stage is trying to incorporate the flour and the water fully. Okay, so just squash it down, move it around the bowl, and get in there. And a good challenge is to see how long you can keep your hands clean for. Right, squashing that in. And what we're aiming for is a nice shaggy dough, uh, ball of dough. It's gonna look quite rough at this stage. As I said, all we're doing is combining flour and water equally, okay? We're not trying to develop gluten or anything at this stage because this is a no-need recipe and I'm a bit lazy. So we're gonna let the flour and the water do all the hard work, which takes us on to our next stage, okay? So once you've got it looking a bit like this, we've got our flour and water fully combined, we're gonna move on to the auto lees. And that is just a fancy French term for uh, having a soak. So we're gonna allow our flour to soak in all of that water and that's gonna kickstart the gluten development, all right? So even without us doing anything to the dough, it's gonna start form forming gluten bonds. Basically, a little bit of a science background. There's two kinds of proteins present in our flour. When you add water, they move towards each other and they wanna hold hands. I know, it's not ideal for the circumstances, but that's just what they do, all right? So with the addition of water, they start forming little bonds and that gives us the long chains of gluten, which then gives us the stretch in our dough. So, by mixing the two together, covering it with a tea towel or a funky shower cap, I've got one in hand, all covers, even a dinner plate on top, works fine, we're just going to cover it loosely, put it somewhere in your kitchen, room temperature, rest it on the bench somewhere, and leave it. Go have a rest, make yourself a cup of tea, watch something on Netflix, come back to it in an hour, and in that time, it's going to have soaked up all that water. Now, it may look slightly different at this stage, uh, just a tiny little bit more shiny maybe, um, but not much has gone on from what we can see. But the real difference is when we get in there, we can pick up a corner of the dough and we can stretch it up now. See, without us having to do anything, that dough has started to develop its gluten and that's where the no need comes into it. So we're off to a great start with this. And I'll just demonstrate the big difference there. This is the one that we've just done. Have a look at that. No structure, doesn't hold, no elasticity. And at this stage, you might knock it out on the countertop and really start thrashing it around and kneading it. That's the traditional way. We're, as I said, a little bit lazy. We're not gonna do that. You don't need to knead the dough. Well, put it this way, the dough doesn't need you to knead it. But if you need to knead, to, if you need to knead the dough, then you can knead the dough. That's absolutely fine as well. You can do a good bout of kneading instead of the stretch and folds. But I like doing the stretch and fold process. It's gentler, it's staged out a bit, it gives the dough a lot of time to develop, 
and it's kind of fun to see all the various stages and see how it goes along. Now, I'll just mention at this point that if you do have a mixer at home, a stand mixer, you can chuck all your ingredients in there, give it a good whiz, and um, combine your ingredients, then let it auto lease in the bowl, and then incorporate the, the, the next bits in there as well, developing gluten. But we're gonna go in old school. So, once we've done, completed our auto lease, and we've got a little bit of gluten development there, we're ready to add our salt. As I mentioned, three ingredients in good sourdough. Salt, flour, water. The salt is essential. Don't be tempted to scrimp on it. If you are a little bit forgetful, got a lot going on, it's fine to add the salt at the start when you're mixing the flour in as well, but the optimal way of doing it for a traditional auto is to leave the salt out. But when we've completed our, all, our auto lees, we can then go in with our salt. And that does two things, right? There's two very important functions that our salt carries out. For one thing, it makes it taste good. So if you leave out the salt, boy, you're going to know about it. It really, really changes the flavor. And also, if you're using a nice, unrefined, artisan sea salt, the sort of creme de la creme is the fleur de sol from France. We get some really good stuff from Australia as well. Look up, uh, get onto Google and find a nice unprocessed, raw, unrefined salt. That's got all the, ba all the minerals and vitamins that are naturally present in the salt that also translate to flavor. But, you know, don't be tempted to use your normal free-flowing table salt, the iodized stuff. Um, basically, they refine the hell out of it take out all the vitamins and minerals, put that into a nice little capsule for you that you can take separately. But if you're using unrefined salt, we're good. So, 2% salt, which is about 10 grams, or about a heat teaspoon. And just get that in there, all right? And um, what we're trying to do is just distribute, distribute it nicely over the dough, nice and even. If you wanna, you can even unleash your inner salt bay and just sprinkle that over evenly. Now the other thing I like to do at this stage, we'll just get that off the scale for a moment, is just get in there. It helps to have wet hands here. Whoops, did I pull up my jug? Never mind, got a squirty bottle. So just wet your hand, maybe a bit over the dough as well. And just press your fingers into the dough. We're okay. halfway. <laughs> Dimple it in, pressing it through the dough, and that's just gonna get it through there nice and even. Once you push that through and dimpled it in, like that, then we're gonna proceed with our first set of stretch and folds. Okay, we're gonna do two or three of these. Depends on the dough. The instructions and the timing are all temperature dependent, so you really do need to get in there and see how things are progressing. But to do a stretch and fold, just wet your hand, and it's literally what it sounds like. Get your bowl, scoop your hand in under the dough, lift it up, Give a little stretch out and fold it back over itself. Turn the bowl. Do that again. Just get your knuckles in and press it down a bit. Be quite thorough at this stage. Really incorporate all those ingredients, get that salt fully mixed through. Because as we move through the process, we're going to want to be a lot more gentle. And we get progressively more and more gentle so that we don't end up knocking out any air from the dough because that's what's going to give us a lovely crumb structure. So all the while, the wild yeast and the bacteria in our sourdough starter is eating the sugars, tempering the gluten in the flour, breaking down those proteins and producing little pockets of air in the dough as a byproduct of that. And we want to try and catch that air, not knock it out. So be quite thorough at this stage, go through a couple of times, get yourself a nice little ball of dough, flip it over, then I like to just get my hand under it, give the bowl a little spin and just um, tuck it in, even it out, give it a little pat. That's looking pretty good to me. Mm -hmm. So now what we'll do is cover this, leave it out at room temperature for about half an hour. You know, at this stage, we've worked the gluten a bit. The dough needs a little bit of time to uh, rest, and frankly, so do we. So go and chuck it down on the countertop. Cover it. Come back to it in about half an hour and 
and I've transferred it into these little um, one liter um, covered glass bowls just for convenience for the demo for today. You can leave it in your bowl. And we're going to go in with our next set of stretch and folds. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention. So, flour and water and salt are the three basic building blocks of good sourdough. But an optional stage, which I quite like to do, is add a bit of oil. So, same amount of salt, one level teaspoon of salt going up, uh, one level teaspoon of oil going in there. And I'm just using the cooking oil we use at home. Nothing too fancy, but that just keeps the bread a little bit fresher for a little bit longer. And um, it also keeps my hands nice and soft. The dough doesn't dry it out then. So I'll just fold that in quickly, get that incorporated. Cover that over, let it rest at room temperature. Half an hour later, we come back to it and we do our next set of stretch and folds. As I mentioned, we're gonna do a few of them just to make sure that that gluten in there is um, really getting a workout and we're really developing our dough. So again, just get your hand in there, get it in under the dough, give it a little wiggle, fold it over and repeat. Go around that bowl and you just really need to go around the bowl once or twice at this stage, just bringing it all back together, making a nice shiny little ball again, flip it over, tuck it in, little pat, job's a good one. Cover, put it to one side. In half an hour's time, we do it again. All right, you can stretch that out. If it's a warmer day, you can make that 20 minutes. If it's a cooler day, you can stretch it out to 40 minutes. Just listen to the dough, see how it's going. Now, um, you wouldn't have noticed a huge amount of rise at that stage, okay? Most of the, the rising actually takes place in the next phase. So all we're doing now is developing that gluten and making sure that the dough has the strength and the elasticity to hold up to the next stage, which is gonna be our bulk proof. To make sure that it is ready to move on to that stage, we're gonna perform a little test. And this is called the window test or the window pane test, basically. Sweat your hands, get in there, pull up a little corner of the dough, give it a little stretch out. And if you can, if you can stretch that out nice and thin to form quite a thin membrane that you can see your fingers through, you can see the light through, that's our little window pane. There we go, that's looking pretty good. Now that tells us that the dough now has enough strength and elasticity to move on to the next stage. So, that'll probably happen around the second or third stretch and fold. If it hasn't, don't panic. Everyone's dough is different. The wind might have been blowing a different direction that day. If it's not, just leave it out on the counter for another 30 minutes and do a last set of stretch and folds. And then, leave it. Leave it for a good hour, maybe two. Keep an eye on it, but leave it out to then perform the bulk proof. This is when it does the bulk of the fermentation. It develops a lot of flavor at that stage and the dough also develops as well. Now you'll know that it's completed its bulk when you can see a noticeable increase in size. Not massive, you know, it's not like yeast of dough, it's probably not gonna double, but you know, about 50%. We can also see some nice, nice bubbles through there and at the base. And if we take the lid off, we can see a little bit of a jiggle going on as well. That tells us we're good to move on to our next stage, which is the, the fun part. Okay, we're gonna move on to our shaping. Now, it's very easy to overdo this stage. So, uh, try and exercise a bit of self-control because this is where it's really fun. It's like basically Play-Doh for adults. You get to play with the dough um, and no one tells you off for eating it. But it's very easy to knock all the air out at this stage, which is something we don't want to do. So let's get ourselves set up. We've got some flour to dust with. Make sure our dough doesn't stick. Get yourself one of these nice little scrapers. Um, this is a bowl scraper invaluable when you're dealing with, with dough. Just get, wet it down. Also wet your board down. 
Notice that we're not using any flour at this stage. We're trying to minimize the amount of flour that we're using. Remember, waste not, want not. And move your little spatula, your little dough scraper around the bowl, just loosening it up from the edges, like that, okay? And just gently, gently, gently scrape it out onto your work surface. Being careful not to knock out that air. Okay, beautiful. Now what I like to do is switch to a proper bench scraper. And uh, top tip here, get one with a plastic handle. It's dishwasher safe, it'll save you so much effort. And all we're gonna do now is pre-shape our dough. Okay, so we're up to the pre-shape stage. And basically all we're doing is gathering up our dough into a nice little cohesive mass with our bench scraper to roughly form an initial round shape, okay? Because we're gonna move on to a shaping process for a ball, which is gonna be a round loaf. Again, French term, we're following in some French lessons for free. Um, and all we're gonna do is use our bench scraper to push the dough along the board to form a rough round shape. Don't overdo it, just real quick, get in there, scrape it down, push the dough around until it's a nice round, roundish shape. That's, that's plenty, that's enough. Which then allows us to move on to the next stage, which is preparing for our cold proof. Okay, so we wanna support the dough as it does its final rise, otherwise it's gonna flatten out, you're gonna end up with pizza rather than a loaf. We want a nice, proud, round loaf of bread. We're going for the ball, remember? French for ball. Okay, so we're using these lovely uh, cane bannertons today. Uh, these are 22 centimeters, hold about a pound, of a, half, a pound and a half of dough, which is what the recipe is scaled to. You can get these on the websites as well. Now, if you do buy one, don't go off and use it straight away. You need to season it first, and that basically just means spraying it with flat water, sprinkling over some flour, letting it dry, and then we're good to go. That forms a little rough, non-stick surface in there. Okay, now, while our dough's resting, we're gonna quickly dust our banneton. So, get yourself a little tea strainer or the likes, and fill it up with about a tablespoon of flour. I'm using rice flour mixed with uh, normal baker's flour. That forms a really nice non-stick surface. And then just move around the, ba the banneton, rotating it so that you get the flour into all the little nooks and crevices, okay? Just a nice, even, light coating of flour. Right, don't be afraid to overdo it, add a little bit more because the last thing we want is for our dough to actually stick to the banneton. So a good little bit of flour going into there. Put that to one side gently, don't slam it down like someone in our household has done before because that knocks all the flour down into the middle of it and you got to start again. Right, so our dough has had a little bit of a rest after the pre-shape. Ideally you want to let that go for like 10 to 30 minutes, just watch the dough. And now we're gonna go on to our shaping proper. So, now we get the flour out because we don't want the dough to stick. Okay, we're gonna dust our board nicely. A Little bit of dust over there. And then, channeling your inner Jamie, Jamie Oliver, just sprinkle a little bit of flour over that dough. Give it a little pat. Make a little bit of a non-stick surface for us to work with. Okay, and now what we're gonna do is use our bench scraper to loosen the dough up from the board and we're gonna scoop it up and flip it over upside down onto the board so this non-stick surface is now on that nice bit of flour over there so it shouldn't stick. All right, so confidently just get in there, scooping a little bit of flour under the dough as you go, loosen it up and then in one confident movement, scoop it up, turn it upside down onto the board. There we go. Now, get some more flour on your hands. You want your hands to be non-stick at this stage. And try and keep one side of your board clear because we need a little bit of, um, a little bit of stickiness on the dough at the end to tighten up the dough. I'll move on to that in a bit. But for now, all we're gonna do is even up this round. We're just making a nice even sort of little circle here, about the size of a side plate, dinner plate. You don't want it too flat. 
and just sort of even that out, pinching the corners, moving it around, making sure it's not sticking to your board. And then what we're going to do is pull out the edges, fold them in on top of the dough, building up those layers in the middle, and then we'll move around, repeat from the other sides. Okay? So if you're not confident about this, have a go on a tea towel first. All right? So there's our little bit of dough. We fold in one side, then the other side, turn it around, fold in, fold in. Okay? And then you just leave it there to rest, just for a moment. All right? So let's go in. Grab our corner, fold it over, other side in, pat it down, just so it all sticks. Let that dough stick to itself and that's going to close everything up, close up those seams. Turn your dough around, repeat from the other side, pat it down, give a little pat. Okay, so now we've got a nice little bundle, a little rough square, which now forms the foundations of our bowl. Okay, you can see it's nice and thick in the middle. We're just going to grab these little corners here and like a little hobo napkin, just fold those little corners in and over the top. All right, and then repeat on those sides. There we go. Give it a little press to make sure all those seams are stuck. And then fold the dough, roll it over, sticky side down. When it's sticky side down, just let it rest for a minute. That's gonna allow all those seams to stick together. Give it about 10 minutes, 15 minutes if you have the time. And then you can move on to the, the, the tightening up. So before we do that, let's talk about our banneton again. Even though we've dusted it already, it still might stick, okay? There still might be some areas in there that haven't been coated yet. Now, to give our dough the best chance of not sticking to the bonneton, we're going to use the power of science. So get your notepads and pens handy for this because it gets a bit technical, okay? To make sure it doesn't stick, we're going to dust it twice. <laughs> so go through there and re-dust it. And the reason why we're doing that is that when your banneton is sitting there, it's actually building up a bit of electrostatic force. Now, when we put our flour on, it uses up all that force and that leaves some bare bits. So if we leave it to the side for a minute, it builds it up the force again and that makes the flour stick to all those bits of banneton that were bare. So use the force, guys. It'll help with not, your dough not sticking. All right, so. Our dough's had a little rest. Now what we're going to do is get in there and give it a little bit of a tighten up. Nice and quick, just go around with your scraper, pushing in towards the middle until you get a nice, tight little bull. Right? Uh, you can also give it a little spin. That just creates a little bit of surface tension with the dough when you spin it so it sticks and it builds up the tension on the side. Move it over to your side of the board that doesn't have any flour on it and then you can sort of drag it in towards you as well. So find which technique works best for you and go, go with that. Yeah. Alright, so once you're happy with the shape, we've done our reshape, we've given it all the strength we can for the long overnight proof, we're going to go in and give it a final dusting with a little bit of rye flour just as a nod to our sourdough starter. It's also a really nice coarse flour, non-stick, doesn't absorb too much water so it's not going to make a sticky mess in your banneton. You don't want that. So, a little bit of love, give it a pat all round, cover all those surfaces. A little bit in the banneton, just for luck. And now, confidently, we're going to scoop our dough up. Make sure it's not sticking to your board at this stage. And we're going to flip it over and then transfer it to the banneton. So, flip it over. Scoop it up with your hands like that and transfer it to your banneton, nice and gentle. Don't let that air out. And the last step is to make absolutely sure that we've done everything we can to stop our dough from sticking. Scrape up all the bits of flour from your board. This is fairy dust, okay? It's all the rough bits and also we don't want to waste it. Pinch it, pinch up a little bit of it like this. Tilt your banneton away from you. That's going to let the dough pull away from the side. And then just sprinkle a little bit of dough, uh, sorry, a little bit of flour around the banneton on the dough. 
because if it is going to stick anywhere, it's going to stick on those corners, on those edges as it rises. So once we've done that, perfect. Gather up some of that flour and just wash your hands of it, you're done. Okay, last thing to do is cover up this banneton. Just nice and loosely. Um, shower cap is ideal. Uh, don't stick it in a plastic bag because that's just going to make water con condense in there and flour and water equals you know, paste. It's just going to be, it'll make your dough stick. Don't do that. All right. Now, that is ready for our long cold proof. We're getting towards the end, guys. That goes in the fridge overnight, six, uh, six to 12 hours, ideally. 24 hours is fine. You can even push it out to two days if you want to. In the fridge. And this one I made last night, it's been sitting in the fridge and that is now ready for us to score and bake, okay? Now, by cold proofing, we allow the dough to de develop a lot more flavor, the fermentation to go for a bit longer. We also take the guesswork out of it. We know that this dough is perfect now to bake. So, we're gonna move on to scoring it. Get yourself a little bit of baking paper, a little bit of scrunch, and I reuse these like four or five times before um, they start falling apart and I can't use it anymore. Get that in there and we're going to flip the dough out onto our baking paper, nice and confident. Say a little prayer and there we go, it didn't stick. Perfect. So we've got a little bit of excess flour, I really, really, really didn't want it to stick for this. So I'm just going to sweep up some of that flour before we go into the oven. And we are going to score it and get ready to bake. So, the reason we score the dough, and that means basically just means scoring a little cross over the top, is twofold again. So, for one thing, it allows the steam within the dough, all that water, to escape, creating a nice little steamy environment for it to bake in, but it also allows it to open up evenly, nice and proud and round and it's gonna you know give us some lovely oven spring if we do that so to score it grab yourself a little knife a little serrated knife like this it's perfect um, I think that's a serrated tomato knife but something like that's gonna work really really well okay and we're gonna score across over the top of it now safety first make sure there's no one around you hold the knife quite loosely and all we're gonna do is confidently cleanly let the, the knife do the work and draw your arm back over the dough. We're going to score it hopefully between two and five mil deep, right? Just a shallow cut. Okay, so there we go. Lovely. Then, that's why it's on baking paper. Turn it round. Do it from the other way. There we go. Awesome. So, that's done. Now, let's talk a little bit about what you're going to bake it in. Um, ideally, you know, good bread can be be baked in a steam oven. We don't all have one of those at home. But what most people have is one of these Pyrex uh, casserole dishes. Okay, if you don't have one, your nan will probably have one. If someone is going to have one of these, which is why we're going to use it, they're perfect for baking sourdough. Now, normally you have them like that. I like to flip it over and just bake it on the base there, using this as a hood. And that hood is going to trap the steam in there and uh, allow the loaf to open up fully without the crust hardening okay so if you don't have one of those if you've got a cast iron casserole pot at home Joe, thank you like these my lovely assistants okay that's perfect flip it over as well awesome the other option is one of these uh the crusoe styly uh casserole this pots. one's actually a victoria this is a victoria one. it is beautiful they work really really well we do have the crusoe awesome. too though there we go <laughs> All right, so an enamel pot or cast iron pot is also ideal. So today we're just going to go with our little bog standard Pyrex one. And preheat your oven as hot as it'll go, right? 2 220 or above would be ideal. Um, you can also preheat your, uh, the pot you're going to bake it in, but for safety's sake, we're going to skip that today. And then get a little squirty bottle and just spray a bit of water over the top of your dough. That's just going to introduce a little bit more moisture in there to create a steam environment for the dough to bake in. And then carefully, 
transfer that into your pot. All right, perfect. Now that's going to go into the oven at, as I said, screaming hot, and I get the best results with that screaming hot oven cold dough from the fridge. Um, at about 220 or above for 20 to 25 minutes, lid on. All right, so pop that in the oven. Top tip here, when you put the top onto this, make sure that the handles are offset so you can actually take that lid off because we're going to bake it for an extra 25 minutes. Well, let's say 15 to 25 minutes, depending on how dark you like your crust uh, with the lid off. So make it easy for yourself. Set yourself up for success. I'll pop that in the oven and be right back. Here's one that we popped in the oven earlier. As you can see, I'm sorry, I just put the lid back on there to keep it nice and warm. You would, of course, bake it with the lid off. As you can see, it's uh, lovely and golden brown. It's popped up nicely. It's opened up beautifully. We've got a lovely crust. And we can be sure that it's actually cooked through. Hot bread here, guys. Hot bread. Oh, 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 oh. Just wrap the bottom and if it sounds hollow like that then you know it's done so that is pretty much it the hardest part now is to just wait 20 minutes or so an hour ideally for the dough to cool down a little bit and actually finishes cooking in that stage if you really can't wait though and we really can all you got to do now is slice it up and enjoy so I'll grab the board, and with that, we've run through all 10 steps to make a beautiful sourdough loaf like this. Okay? Perfect. Any questions for the end? Joe? Nice. what have we had? So I think you'll agree how Ange has pulled that all together. Um, we did have a few questions, and um, so Stephen asked, how do you top up a starter? This was at the start. Ooh, okay. So, when we top it up or refresh it or feed it, we're just gonna be uh, adding the same amount of flour and water combined. So if you've got 100 grams of starter, ideally keep less, keep about, you know, max 50 grams in the fridge, uh, then you're just gonna give it 50 grams flour and water, 25 flour, 25 water combined. Um, that'll keep it happy for the next 12 hours or so. We'll pop it back in the fridge for another week. Now, Regina asked how many grams of uh, leaven um, and I think a few people came backwards and forwards. Is it 100 grams? Yeah, 100 grams. So that's around 20%, which is perfect for our loaf. Um, Ali said you rock Ange. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Ali. And Annette said she loved the live demo, so we'll be hopefully doing some more of those. Victoria, now this is one that I don't understand, so hopefully you can explain it. What changes do you need to make for spelt or coruscant flour? Right, okay. So, I know it might be hard to get all the different flowers at the moment so just substitute it with the best you can if you wanted to you could use spelt or corsan in place of the the whole grain flour that we used um, as long as it was a whole grain one as well so I would just swap it out and use um, that 20% or 50 grams of your corsan or spelt uh, same with the white flour if you had a white spelt you wanted to use instead you could do that uh, it just might be a little bit different and spelt sometimes a little bit tricky to work with. So have a go at it using the uh, plain baker's flour initially and that's going to sort you out, uh, help you get a more hands-on feel for it and develop your baker's hands. They only come with time. Okay, there's a couple more questions. Uh, Joseph asked, um, is there anything you can do to make the crust a bit softer? Yes, you can. Keep it covered. So if you keep it covered while you're baking it, it's not gonna develop that full crust. I mean, this one is pretty good. It's got a nice even crust, nice even crumb. Yeah. Sounds good. Smells good, hopefully it'll taste good too. Uh, and the other thing you can do is, uh, once it's cooled down a bit, just pop it in um, a sealed container, uh, like pop it back in the pot or something, and that'll allow the crust to soften up a bit. I often put them in those little um, what are they? They're like rice fibre, eco-plastic bags. 
um, and that works really well too. So I think the last question I saw there was Sophie asked, why do you put oil in your sourdough? Well, as I said, that's an optional step. It's a preference for me. Um, I started doing it about a year ago because I was making quite a lot of bread through the winter and I just found that the oil kept my hands nice and soft and the, the dough does have a tendency to dry out your hands if you're doing quite a lot of baking. Um, it's also an opportunity to add a little bit of um, extra omega-3 into your diet which is good because I'm using a nice avocado oil there but you can skip that if you want to. You could also use a nice extra virgin olive oil if you wanted to. Um, uh, yeah, macadamia nut oil, it's whatever you've got at home. So Priscilla is asking, do, can you recommend a good brand of strong baker's flour? And she's not saying this, but I, we may have to wait for it. But yeah. <laughs> um, do you have a recommendation for a good? I do. I use Eden Valley flour. It's a lovely biodynamic one that's grown a stone throw, a stone throw from Perth out in the wheat belt. It's what I raised my starter gel on. Jill short for wadjil, which is the uh, acacia that grows there normally. And that's grown by the Lloyd family out in the wheat belt. So, you know, support local where you can, guys. Um, we have a question, how do you refresh the loaf, which we saw before? Ooh, okay, so that one is a great one. So if you have done two loaves and you want a refresh one for, um, for the table, for Sunday dinner or something, just get your squirty bottle, give it a good light misting all over, bottom included, and pop it back into your uh, covered baking thing, give it 20 minutes in a moderate oven at about 180 degrees and it's gonna come up good as new. Okay, so there's a few more um, questions there, but we're going to post this on YouTube and um, you'll be able to look at it. Um, we know there was a few volume issues probably because we are actually in our um, store, one of our stores. Sorry about that guys, I am quite quiet spoken as well. We I normally have give tried to phone. use my big voice. Um, so anyway, it will be uploaded to YouTube and um, the, the rest of the questions, I think you'll find the answers there as well. But um, keep asking some questions and we can answer them as well. Um, and between Ange and us, we'll, we'll get back to you soon. So. I think everyone out there would love to thank Ange for doing this for us. It's all new territory for us as there's so many new things going on at the moment, but I think we might have to taste this because it smells amazing. Sorry guys, <laughs> I wish we could share it with you. And hopefully so we'll be back to doing our in-store demos soon, but I think we'll continue some of these as well because it seems like a lot of people are saying how awesome it is and how they're at home and things like that and this has been a great thing for them so thank you so much. Oh, it's a pleasure Joe. it's Good great to be able to share it. We're doing those aren't yep. we? This yeah. is what we're doing. Thank you, see you guys, thanks a lot for coming along and we'll see you again soon. We've got some more coming up. We're thinking of doing piping, pasta making, a series of pasta making and anything else you guys want to see. I think we might try and do an advanced sourdough. So. You're the perfect audience for it. You know how to do the basics now. Have a good and, practice. And um, any, anything you really want to see, we'll make it happen. Just, just send us a message. So thank you. See you later. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Joe. Woo.